newspapers, greeting the discourse, uh, is our in-house analyst for today, Mr. Adefolari Olami Lekon. Hmm. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for having me. A very good morning to all our viewers out there. Now, the right place to begin with is uh, mm -hmm. the back and forth counter accusations, mm -hmm. allegations, results, uh, manipulations as alleged by Yaga Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make following the outcome of uh, the Edo Guba polls? It was indeed violence free. Mm -hmm. The Federal Executive Council has well noted that. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is, is, as it concerns the position of the political actors who were on the ballot as well. We should expect political actors to be on a mixed reaction. We should also expect uh, election observers to also be on a mixed reaction. And uh, for me, it's about we understanding the nature and character of election in Nigeria. Until we begin to understand the nature and character of election in Nigeria, deal with three major issues. One, financial inducement of voters, the, the, the do or die affairs expressed by politicians, and the biased activities of individual and stakeholders in the election uh, process in Nigeria. We can't rule that out because every stakeholder that you see have an interest. Either you are an election observer, whether you're politicians, whether we are even standing from the, from the media uh, ownership point of view, you have a stake to protect. And that's why the nature and character of election in Nigeria always expresses. So we always find this mixed reaction coming from people who have interest or who have a sub, I mean, a, 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 a subsector in interest in a particular state when it comes to election. For instance, the political parties that are complaining about losing the election. I, I, I take a deep reflection, a deep analysis of the whole issue. How did Governor Basike become a PDP member? And how did he turn out at the end of the day becoming a PDP member? Many people have forgotten that the cost of PDP losing a due election on Saturday was as a result of the greed associated with Governor Basike. The greed to hold on to power and to ensure that all the PDP faithful who helped him to secure PDP nomination were thrown after that political party. The likes of Dan Obie, the former Edo State PDP chairman, till tomorrow, he's not more a member of PDP at the state level, but he's a member of PDP at the state, at national level. And what caused him to be out of that political party at the state level? Because of Obaseke greed to hold on to power. And not also forget that when Obaseke won the second term of his uh, governorship in 2020, it took him over six months to appoint commissioner because he brought in all APC members into PDP and he established them and made them executive of PDP in Edo State. Many people have forgotten that these are the grievance majority of PDP followers had against him that also caused his fallout in the election. And not to forget it abysmal failure. Till tomorrow, nobody can point to uh, what one kilometer of road that Obaseke built in eight years. In terms of infrastructural development, in terms of taking care of the people, apart from the civil servant that is paying 70, whatever, what other uh, policy initiative or policy trust that Obaseke had in eight years in Edo State. It's all challenging. Road infrastructure is lacking there. So those are the things I look deeply. Then to, for APC, we already know that the person that APC presented as the candidate that won the election was also a PDP member. In 2003, he was in House of Rep from 2007 to 2009, uh, 2003 to 2011. And he was in PDP until 2020. So he only ch uh, changed course of uh, cross capacity to APC when he discovered that he could not get the senatorial ticket on that PDP. And he crossed over. And who cost him that senatorial ticket? It was the same Obasike. So you can discover that from time immemorial, within the shortest time that uh, Obasike crossed to PDP, he has caused a lot of damages to PDP at the Edo State. So a majority of their stakeholders left that party and went to APC. And they formed majority. And they became uh, strong holders in the APC. And those are the people that struggle with it to the point that in 2023 general election, a PDP could not present a, a senatorial candidate and as of assembly candidate. And that alone caused PDP those damages in its 2024 uh, governorship election that we are talking about. And Okpobolo that we are talking about is a PDP member. And we may not be surprised tomorrow if he jump ship and go back to PDP. Because in 2023, 2003, 2007, it was PDP. Till 2020, it was still in PDP. So it is just the thinking, the strategy that APC used that worked for them. Dennis Idaosa, the deputy governor to Pablo, was also a PDP person. And Dennis Idaosa was a very strong candidate in PDP before he crossed over to APC. You can see the, 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 the strategy that APC used for the election. They brought two strong candidates. If you remember when they conducted their primaries, there was a challenge between uh, professor, uh, one professor that, conduct, that also participated in the governorship primaries, Okwabolo himself, and Dennis Idaosa. And President Tunubu called them to understand, and said, okay, you guys have to work as a team. And two of them stepped down for Okpabolo. And Dennis Odaosa was speak. And these two guys, Okpabolo and Dennis Odaosa, are grassroots politicians. Till tomorrow, most people know them. And Dennis Odaosa is from the South. 
then uh, Okwabolo is from uh, the central. You can see the combination. Meanwhile, who did the uh, uh, PDP pick as a running, running mate to Igadolo? They went and picked somebody uh, somebody from the central, I mean from the north of Edo State. That may not have much political weight, like the two grassroots politicians that they picked. I'm just trying to paint, I mean, illustrate some of the challenges that brought the defeat of uh, uh, PD, uh, PDP. Now, well, whilst you strongly are purporting that mm. uh, the results were hinged on the way Edo people rated the mm. past administration under mm. Governor Godwin Obaseke, some election monitoring teams, the likes of Yaga Africa, mm. uh, are looking at it from the angle of vote buying. We did see the Nigerian police force and uh, officers of the EFCC make several arrests mm -hmm. during the conduct of the polls. Mm. But many are saying that that might not be as widely blown out of proportion exactly. as reported in the margins that it might have affected the outcome of the election. Mm. But particularly, it's the action of the PDP, despite these ratings that you're saying, mm. looking to take their case to court. Mm. What do you make of this uh, post-election tribunal drama that mm. ensues after most elections in Nigeria? I think the first thing that most political parties will also cry about, nobody is crying about, uh, I think earlier in the stage of the election, people are saying overvoting, overvoting. All of a sudden, the issue about overvoting died down. I was surprised that nobody is talking about overvoting again. Then the next thing we are hearing is uh, financial inducement of voters. Then the next thing is manipulation of results. But we know that in court, it's going to be very difficult to prove financial inducement of voters. In court, it's going to be very difficult to, for you to prove manipulation of results. Get it. And these are the two things that if, uh, PDP may be taking to court because right now they, they are not getting grips of where overvoting was carried out. You get it. Nobody has really pinpointed, okay, uh, there's overvoting in this place, just like in the Kogia election that we saw overvoting happening here and there. But in the uh, election, there is no much trace of overvoting. But what we know that is evidence is that there was inducement. But guess what? The entire political parties uh, induce voters. It's just that the bigger uh, pocket. Have the have the day, all of them, both PDP, LP, all of them had financial inducement on voters. But the only thing is that the ones that have the bigger deep, deep pocket are the ones that the people felt that they feel that okay, this could work for us. And not to forget the 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 the, the, the grassroots political uh, in, inclusion of uh, Dennis Idausa and Okpabolu, who are known to be grassroots politicians. You get it. So we must be able to put that in place. But when going, when PDP going to court. And I also ask, which of the PDP is going to court? Is it PDP national or the PDP state? That, that, that's another angle to it. This purported in-house trouble mm -hmm. in the People's Democratic Party, PDP, where mm -hmm. it seems as though the governors are split across choices mm -hmm. in line with the position of the national chairman. Exactly. We're looking at some of the rumored mm -hmm. moves to sack Damago. Mm -hmm. We've seen the likes of uh, Governor Shei Makinde, mm -hmm. Governor Ademola Adeleke mm -hmm. throwing their weights behind Damagung and standing behind him. Mm -hmm. But the likes of their counterparts in Bauchi disagree with the party's position on the national chairman. Mm -hmm. Do you think this would further affect PDP going into the off-cycle elections in Ondo and Anambra? Definitely it will. It has already affected them in Edo. You can see how divided they are. You can see the last uh, campaign they did before the election took place. They, how many of them attended that uh, uh, Grand Valley uh, support uh, campaign for uh, Gadolo. They didn't go because they are already divided. And the reason why they are divided was that the person, the governor they were going to the state to do the campaign was not attending their meeting. He doesn't come to Vadata, Vadata House in Abuja for a PDP uh, expanded meeting with governors. He doesn't attend. You get it. And the reason why he doesn't attend was that he doesn't have a grand standing to attend because he chased out all PDP members, all original PDP members in those state. He chased them out and replaced them with APC members. So, as far as uh, the PDP is concerned, they are more or less that the, uh, uh, the, the APC transformed PDP. Many of the people in PDP in national, they don't even they, they don't regard them as PDP because the entire NWC of Edo uh, PDP are not be, are not the ones are the original ones are not the ones uh, occupying those seats in Edo uh, State. So those, that alone have made it so difficult for them. Then other aspect has to do with the issue of who is going to sponsor the court case, because as we speak right now. Uh, uh, about basket will winding up. So where will the money come from? And PDP National is not interested because they know that it is still themselves, it is still their man that is occupying their those state as far as they are concerned. The, the, dep the deputy governor, the main governor, Gadolo, they are all former PDP members. So it is just like it is still our guys that are there. So they will always have a way to throw banter. And that's what Nigerian politics is. 
As I later pointed out when we started, I said, we need to understand the nature and character of election in Nigeria. The politicians already understood the game. Forget this rigmaro paparazzi they are doing on, on media. They already know where their stand is. As far as I'm me, as an analyst, I'm concerned. I know the PDP, the real original PDP in Edo are happy that finally Obaseke has have been thrown out because now they can now go back and take their party and rearrange and re-strategize without Obaseke because Obaseke holding on to power as governor and if it had happened that he win the election, he would have still continued to hold on to that power and struggle the original PDP of Edo State out of power in Edo State. But as it is now, the original PDP members of Edo State are happy that Obaseke because now he won't be able to have any uh, uh, grit to hold on to the party again because he has lost and if he goes to court, the PDP national may not be interested in the case because it's still their man, it's still their people that are still there. Now, let me ask you another question before we look at more newspapers this morning, and it's away from the PDP, P mm. P PDP now. Mm. The APC at the national level is making strong comments. We've seen comments coming in from the chairman, uh, Dr. Alhaji Abdullahi Ganduje, who mm. says the votes in Edo State are a testament. Mm to the APC government at the national. Mm. Others are arguing that the results are a reflection of federal might mm. in the presence of the political juggernauts starting from the number three citizen mm -hmm. to senators under the APC who mm. all were in Edo off up until the results were announced. Mm. For you, do you think it is a reflection of the APC at the national level in terms of its policies in which Edo people thrust to be reflected at the state level or it is indeed an influence of federal might? Definitely, we cannot allow all those factors you have mentioned. Federal might, the strategic input of APC at national level or at their state level, and also the APC taking advantage of the divide and rule that is taking place in PDP. Because we must note that the divide and rule, because as far as PDP is concerned, it is divided. There is a group that hold on and in support of the national, uh, acting national chairman. There is a group that expected a new change. Convention should be organized, a new person should, be, should, should come up to power. Just last week, the, a court has already struck out the Northern PDP uh, court who wanted Damago to be removed as acting national chairman and be replaced by someone from the North Central. And the court have said, no, that cannot happen. You can see that it has won in that regard. Now, the federal might will always play, play in every obstacle election. We can't rule that out. Either under PDP or under APC or any other political party, the federal might will always be because they will always use the machinery of the state to ensure that they get victory. Although under uh, Buhari, that did not work because Obasuke won uh, those state back to back. But we can see that currently it has worked. And how did it work? They took advantage of the divide and rule or the division within the PDP to win the election. And how did they do that? They co opt or agree PDP in those state into APC. Do you know how many PDP, I mean, cross carpet into APC just a few months before the election? A lot of them, in their hundreds. Some don't even don't want, want to come out to show themselves. The like of uh, Dan uh, Obi, the former chairman of PDP in Edo State. As far as he's concerned now, and you can see the template of how the election goes, PDP only struggle to win six local government. You can see the contention. A lot of people are not looking at the voting pattern, even though they are saying it is manipulated. But we also need to look at the voting pattern. Look at the areas that APC was able to win overwhelmingly and look at the areas that PDP contend with them. And that gives credence because the deputy governor of uh, uh, Edo State, elected uh, the deputy governor, is from Edo uh, South, which comes from the same area of the current governor. And he also wanted to become a governor before. But because it has already been agreed that power must shift to the center. And that's why they also stepped down for Mayor Pablo to become and that really paved. And the downside is a very contentious individual who is a grassroots politician who helped PDP in the past to win election as a grassroots politician before he crossed over to APC. And that also worked for him. You can see the pattern. So that division in PDP really gave APC that opportunity. And now they are taking it to uh, Ondo State too. Because as I speak right now, Ondo PDP is also divided. In Oshu State, PDP in on Oshu State is also divided. You can see that if APC strategically take advantage of this opening within the uh, opposition party. They will always win the election because they will co ask the members who are aggrieved to themselves and they give the opportunity to even go for the election because one of the good things that APC did, which I look at, which was very strategic, was that Okpopolo was a very popular candidate as an House of Reps member because of his grassroots politics that he played. Then he also had the same thing 
and they coerced them. The real APC candidate who contested the primaries, they didn't allow them to go, even though they are from the center. You get it? So they know that these are the things that work for them. And they are also taking it to Undo State also. And that could also work for me. And if they go to Oshun State, it could also work for them. Including Anambra that's also coming in some few months. Because in Anambra, Anambra too, as we speak right now, PDP is nowhere to be found. It's just Abga. And there is also challenge in that place. So they may also take advantage of that to win election come. But the other thing we also need to look at is what Yaga is saying. Through their, they call it process, process, uh, uh, process voters result uh, for integrity uh, transparency test, which they claim that uh, about three local government, already the local government, uh, uh, Ekoboi local government, as well as Ego local government, that they had issues. That there are 300 observers they sent out who observe, who collated results from that particular local government. The, what they give, the, the feedback data they give them was different from what was announced by INEC. And they said that, like for instance, the 30,000 vote that APC got in Oredo, the 11,000 vote that, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, P A P uh, PDP got in the uh, S and West, as well as the, the, uh, 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 Equal uh, by E vote that uh, LP got that there was discre discrepancy in those figures, and I need to look into it. But the question that people now ask is that he, uh, Yaga didn't use machine, didn't use robot to collect those data. They also use human being. What about if the observer also were not too factual, not too correct in the data they are receiving? Because those are the questions we need to also put because they are all humans, and the entire 300 observer that they, they sent out. Majority of them are from Edo State. And we also know how politics is being played locally. People who have sympathy for a particular political party and use the opportunity to also do injustice to the data it's collecting. So those are the issues. But we cannot throw away what they have said, and which is a question to INEC and a, um, a resolution that INEC needs to attend to. Although they also ask that uh, the electoral act needs to be looked at. And National Assembly must look at how we can have electronic transmission of results, although not electronic voting, because people are confusing electronic voting with electronic transmission of results. What they ask electronic transmission that as results are as people are casting their vote, it can be electronic transmitted immediately. As I'm punching the, the, the my, my whatever I'm doing to vote, the result is transmitted electronic, and that's what they're asking for. Well, let's look at more newspapers. It's been a great uh, projection and conversation with the analysis coming from Mr. Defo Larry Olami Lekon. More newspapers this morning still reporting situations in uh, the Edo Gube elections and the outcome, as perceived by the opposition parties and election observers, are captured on the Punch newspaper, The Matrix, and The Vanguard. Now, let's look at these three papers again and would uh, look at more newspapers greeting our discussion this morning. On the Punch newspaper, you'd find the lead story beneath the masthead with the catchphrase Edo Poe. PDP demands fresh correlation as the LP Akpata alleges fraud. PDP demands fresh correlation as LP Akpata alleges fraud. Inserted beneath that, you'd find prominent pictures of the Federal Executive Council meeting as chaired by President Bola Metinibu. While straplines greeting the headline story on the punch read, INEC must abide by Section 65 of Electoral Act 2022, says Damagum. Poll was a transaction, not election, says Labour Party. On the Matrix newspaper, you'd find the headline story, Condemnation, Outrage, Trail, Edo Guba Results. Edo election failed integrity tests, witnessed widespread result manipulation, says Yaga. Igodalo breaks silence, says our mandate was stolen. PDP heads to court. Obi Akpata condemn election outcome. Bimon 20% voters turnouts. Now above the headline, flooding, FEC swings into action, unveils multi-pronged strategies. Elumelu to chair disaster relief fund committee, would serve technical committee to assess dams. U.S. expressed deep concerns, offers support. And above the masthead, FG proposes stabilization bill to improve economy. Now, and away from these two papers, let's look at more newspapers. We'll first look at the Vanguard and then also look at this day newspaper. But let's begin with the Vanguard newspaper this morning before we cross over to this day. On Vanguard, you'd see the headline, Edo will meet APC, INEC in court, 
to retrieve mandates. We'll meet APC INEC in court to retrieve mandates, says PDP. Says result unacceptable. Adds APC PDP poll transactional, not election. Fek Oyebanji Sawolu Abiodu Ayedatiwa Ododo. Others greet Okpebolo. It was tape capture, not election, says Obi. Lawyers, forensic analysis will determine my next move, says Apata. Now let's also pick up this day on this day newspaper. You'd find beneath the masthead, Ganduje greets Okpebolo, says AP Civil Recover, more states. Sonwolu, Uzodemma, Abiodu, Ododo, Southern Senators, Others congratulate winner. CSOs. Edo Guba results altered. Lacks legitimacy. PDP to head to court. Calls Mountain INEC to review results. Igodalo. It is one of our darkest moments. OB election. A mockery of democracy. Exercise marred by votes buying. Falsification of results. Now, now, this continues to be one of the widespread headlines. But mm -hmm. let's also look at some of the issues as raised. Mm. The Labour Party failing to win any out of the 18 local government areas in Edo State mm. have cited voter apathy. They mm. say the voter turnout was just about 20%. Mm. Many ask the question of if that was uh, in any way affected by the failure of the PDP to sign the peace accord. Mm. Although there was no violence. Mm -mm. Did mm. the voters perceive that the polls were going to be violent? And is that why... We're having only 20% voter turnout. Mm. On the other hand, on the part of the electoral umpire INEC, mm. would there be a need to review the results, particularly in those three local government areas where some discrepancies were noted? I, I think the discrepancy fall on each of the political party. The 30,000 era that Yaga said that uh, it may not be correct for APC, and the 11,000 that was also said that may not be correct for uh, PDP, and the one that uh, they also talk about the Labour Party. All the three political parties that were contesting the election, all of them have issues that the Yaga pointed out. But going forward is for me to quickly point out that for Labour Party, they should know that the, the election uh, uh, for their candidate lost because of the, the candidate they presented. Edo people have already spoken that the Edo governorship for 2024 goes to the centre, not to south south to the south of Edo again. So the Labour Party is supposed to have understood that from the beginning and presented a, a credible candidate that could have been a force to APC and PDP. Instead of providing, uh, prov uh, prov I mean, uh, providing a candidate that was already out of the calculation of Edo people for that election. So for me, it was their own fault. And uh, if anybody is saying it's transactional, they also participated in transactional. Who said that uh, Labour, Labour did not also uh, carry out inducement? Though know, they can carry out inducement in several ways, not unnecessarily financial inducement, that's been alleged on the other two political parties. They all also carry out inducement. Giving people t shirt giving people face cap. Is it not inducement? So we must also be able to understand that. But for me, why they labor laws was because of the candidate they presented. They would have followed the minds, the feelings of those people that this time around power shift to the center. And look for a credible candidate at the center to contest for the election, not to go and look for another candidate from the south, which Akpata is from, to contest for the election. And that's how they lost. Then in terms of the 20% voters turnout, it is always like that. Uh, Off-season election will always be like that. Not just off-season election. Any election in Nigeria, because the mindset of people that you see that go and buy, I mean, go for a registration for a voter card, everybody is not getting a voter card necessary to, co to contest for election. They are getting it for other purposes, which can help them to help their life. So we must understand that. And as I said, I pointed out when we started, I said the nature and character of election in Nigeria have made some of us to understand that when election comes, we know what the politicians will do. We know what the stakeholders will also do. But the result will always come with mixed reaction, particularly from the loser and particularly from the winner, because all of them will always have one reaction or the other to paint. But the thing is that, as is, we speak right now, contending for the election in court is expected, and we expect the both parties who will go and fight for it in the court to go. But it's going to be very difficult to prove election a, a loss in the court, particularly when you went, when you go and cite issues that doesn't have to be taken care of by electoral act or by the constitution. So I'm not expecting PDP to go and begin to cite issue of certificate or no certificate because yesterday we saw on social media people started saying a uh, law did not go to school, and some people say he went to investor of Bini, some people say he went to investor of Abuja, some people say he has a PhD. So 
that should not be the issue. And one plain fact about this election was that there was no violence. So nobody can go to court and begin to say there was violence. Although there was a, a, a minute issue at two local government collusion centers, Oredo and uh, Ego, as well as Okoboyi, because of when the issue started, then INEC now said, okay, instead of doing the collusion here at the local government uh, headquarters, take it to the, to the state office. And that's where it was done. You get it? And that was one of the reasons why many people are saying, okay, that could be where uh, manipulation could have started. But for the Labour Party, they should know that the failure of the party in this election was their fault. They presented a wrong candidate for their governorship election in Edo State. Now, whilst we're tempted to dwell solely on the reactions and publications as captured in line with the conclusion of the Edo Gube elections and the tantrums being shown by political actors who felt aggrieved by the results, other issues in the news of national concern also are captured on the front page of the New Telegraph. On the New Telegraph this morning, it is as the federal government moves to mitigate the effects of flooding by setting up a technical committee now saddled with the responsibility of reassessing the states of dams nationwide. And this is with the allegations as thrown by some quarters of the media as a result of the cause of the flooding in Borno, which has been blamed on the Alao Dam. Now, this morning, uh, published on the front page of the New Telegraph, you'd find the lead story in that regard. Let's pick it up together now, shall we? On the New Telegraph, you'd find the lead story, Flooding, FEC, sets up committee to reassess, allow them, others, floats disaster relief fund. Flooding, FEC, sets up committee to reassess, allow them, others, floats disaster relief fund. Now, more on the strap lines beneath this story on the New Telegraph this morning, you'd find captured beneath the headline, Government advises residents of flood-prone areas to leave as River Bello water level rises to 0.9 meters. U.S. offers support to 67,000 flood victims in Borno as EU okays 5.4 million euros to aid victims in Nigeria or the countries. Now, above that, you'd find previous administration never thought it wise to develop FCT satellite towns, says Wike. Reoccurring building collapse, monumental economic losses to the nation's GDP growth, says LCCI. Court dismisses suit seeking Gandhu J. Sark as APC chair. FG approves National Citizens Value Brigade in schools, national symbols standardization. Uh, these are the prominent pictures as captured on the front page of the new telegraph now the challenge here as we look at this development in terms of the response mm. with the federal executive council now setting up a technical committee to mm. review the dams mm. is also coming with another warning of the release from the lagdo dam in cameroon exactly are you satisfied with the approach as taken by the federal executive council uh, although many of us have said this is coming very late you know, such technical committee would have been set up beginning of the year or, or, or when the government came in last year. The 2022 flood was very massive. You know, the 2020, 2012 as well as 2018 flood was also massive. A report of such nature would have been reviewed by the government and the uh, action would have been taken at the beginning of this year, not now. But although it's not too late, a review of those dams across the country. There are over 184 dams in Nigeria either major dams or many or micro dams across the country. So it's all owned by the federal government, except there's some state in Southwest that owns dams. So we expect them to review those dams and see the challenges that those dams are faced. Uh, and for me, I don't see those challenges having, those dams having more challenges as expected because what has become their challenge is just the maintenance, the usefulness of those dams. Some of them are not being put to use. You get it? So maybe the technical committee will look at how they can be put, put to use particularly for agriculture and food production purposes and storing of water. Then for the, uh, they also say the relief fund uh, committee also be put together also, which is quite encouraging. But we just hope that it will not look like the COVID-19 committee that was put together that it, today nobody can really tell us how much was realized, how much was spent, and where are the balance of the money that was spent on COVID-19 exercise during the Boari administration. Because the committee of such nature like this was so put together until now, till tomorrow, Nobody can tell us how much they collected, how much they spent. And they're also pushing and uh, mounting someone, a very popular individual, 
a former banker Lumen. to become just the way they did for the other COVID-19 by appointing Dangote as the chairman of that particular. And even Tulio Milu was also part of that committee then. Till till now, nobody have told us how much was spent, how much was left in that committee of COVID-19. But we are just trying to sound uh, very interesting to them so that we, they know that as much as we are concerned, money will come in. I want to know how much was used. For the, I, I think it was yesterday that I was going to a report that in Borno State, for example, over 13 billion was promised for victim of uh, Borno flooding. And what was realized so far has, has been just 4.8 billion. A lot of money is still expected. And I asked those people putting those reports, I said, even these 4 billion that have been realized, people should follow up on those money and see how they are being used for those projects that have been outlined. Because a lot of individuals are also doing one or two things. And as we speak right now, the flooding area in Madugubi have, uh, have, have, have received, you know, most of the area, although the people need so called maybe some building will need to be pulled down and rebuilt and the rest of them. But There's also are... challenges of waterborne diseases associated mm -hmm. with the flooding that a lot of uh, foreign organizations mm -hmm. are quite concerned about. Exactly, exactly. And they are doing one or two things in that regard, donating, contributing one or two. But what we, the concern is that after contributing and putting all this money together for these people, we just want accountability and transparency at the end of the day. Now, now talking about this accountability and transparency as well sought by millions of Nigerians mm. in regards to how we manage disaster. Mm. Now, my concern, I don't know if you should share the same sentiment, mm. is the difference now between what will constitute the disaster relief fund mm -hmm. and the earlier provided for ecological fund. I, I think they are different. Ecological fund is constitutional. No, no, my own is on the transparency and accountability in the use of the funds. Definitely. While a lot of persons are not too certain on how the ecological fund has been dispersed over, over time. Over years, yes. Now we're talking about a disaster relief fund. Side by side, a provision earlier made for ecological fund to address issues affecting our eco and climate system. Now, for instance, the ecological fund is not meant to be buying mattresses for people. It's not meant to be buying noodles, spaghetti, rice, beans for people and be sharing. No. Ecological fund is to address infrastructural gap within an area that's been affected by erosion or any other climate issue or natural disaster issue that occur as a result of maybe flooding or as a result of a uh, land uh, landsliding or, uh, or, or, or or something that are, or earthquake you get it so it happens it has to do with something that affects the ground so in this nature now ecological funds supposed to address issue of pavement some infrastructural issues, particularly drainages. Because one of the things that cause erosion around Nigeria is lack of drainages and maintenance of drainages. Water channels that could be well proven, well maintained. So ecological funds are supposed to be taking care of those areas and be able to construct you no know, community road, feeder community road that will take care of areas that are lacking some accessible roads. Those are the things that ecological funds are supposed to be doing. And it has been lacking because the governors are pocketing the money using for say, or other things now the relief fund we are talking about is to cater for health issues nutritional issues as well as some social welfare package of the people like giving them so-called in terms of rebuilding their houses getting them some clothing getting them some food rebuilding schools and some health facilities those are what the uh, the relief fund will do not to go and do what the ecological fund is meant to do and it's not going to be used for concerning uh, construction of roads or, or drainages because that's the way I understand the relief fund will definitely take care of. Particularly business people who have lost their businesses, they'll get some cash uh, uh, transfer from that angle. Now, the challenge is now mm. with this advisory is issued by the mm. federal government to states owing to a rise in the water level in exactly. the Benway by 0 0.9 meters. Mm. The challenge is, where do we relocate them to? Are there provisional shelters mm. or buildings other than IDP camps where these persons are expected to relocate to? Mm. That's one. Mm. On the other hand, we've been having this conversation of the need for counter dams mm. to somewhat act as buffers mm. when the Lagdo Dam overflows or mm -hmm. should we have a failure in structural integrity of any of these structures on ground. Exactly. And very interesting that uh, over the years, I think particularly from 2012, 2018, 2022, 2020 and 2022 uh, flood, as well as the one that we are trying to experience right now in 2024, it has been established that we need to have a, a shelter for people we are asking to relocate. State government is supposed to do that. But most times, some of those residents in their area, sometimes they can be reluctant to leave. And because of the, the negligence of the government to be enforce that relocation, the people stay behind. And again, you also need to understand the nature of the buildings of 
those houses within that area. A good example is if you are traveling out of Abuja to Lokoja. Now you see that the, the Confluence River overflows its boundary into communities. Then you ask yourself, these communities have been there for years. They have built choice houses. They have built infrastructure that when you ask them to leave those infrastructure, it will be very difficult for them to leave. So the concern is not for people to leave. The concern is to monitor the kind of structure they are putting in that place. Because when someone put a permanent structure that wants to stay in there, build a house that could last for 100 years, and now water will come, you now ask the person to leave that place for the next one month or two months. It will be scared. You will say, where, where, where will I go? So the issue is that we should monitor those structures that are being built across river bank. You get it? And that will help us to be able to mitigate some of these challenges. Then on the other hand, whereby uh, the communal dam will be open and water will flow in. The safeguarding alternative to also buffer that area has been said over time to be built, but what is the government doing about it? They are not, very, they are not too serious. There have been arguments and counter arguments that there was nothing like that. And there was a particular dam in Adamawa that was supposed to be built since 1973. Till today, that dam has not been built. The land is there. The signboard has been put. They renewed the signboard, but they are not building the, the dam. So we need to call the government to order that even if it's not going to be possible to build it, build it in Adamawa, is there another possible state that that uh, dam could be built? And again, these other 180 something dams are available. What can we do to allow those dams to maintain them, to assess those water that are coming from the Lado Dam in Cameroon? Because that is also very important. And one thing I've discovered was that why the government is not very serious about building new dams is because there are over, over 184 of them and nobody's maintaining them. And budget allocation are pushed to them. But nobody is caring about those dams. Maybe that's why the government is not too forthcoming in building a new dam. Because over 184 dams, what are we doing with them? And that called to question why the new government, the technical, the technical committee that are formed, those technical committees should go and review those dams and see how useful they could be at this point in time that we have found ourselves as a nation. Now let's accommodate more newspapers mm -hmm. greeting our discourse this morning and crossing over to the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper the headline story is on the controversial Samoa agreement and an ombudsman that is advising the editorial team of Daily Trust to issue an apology for the misinformation as earlier reported when the agreement was signed in terms of the implications bordering on LGBTQ promotions, which was not the case. Now we'll find that headline story on the Daily Trust with the catchphrase Samoa agreements. Ombudsman asked Daily Trust to apologize says newspaper story inaccurate fg's handling poor praises complaints respondents for voluntary submission beneath that you'd find more feature stories to your left bandit leader kachala sharme killed in gang clash in kaduna fg to establish national citizens value brigade in schools conflict of interest stalling constituency project says efcc icpc on the right, a uh, big story of concern that we're looking at uh, as we react to these stories is uh, despite efforts to eradicate polio in Nigeria, mm -hmm. 70 polio variants recorded in 14 northern states, says the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get your reactions to some of the stories. How alarming is it mm -hmm. that despite investments, mm -hmm. vaccine rollout, mm -hmm. the drive to eradicate polio, mm -hmm. not one, but 70 Seven. new variants of mm -hmm. polio Recorded particularly in the northern states, 14 it's, of them. It is sad, you know, the, the awareness, the sensitization, the education and information is still going, but uh, it seems that uh, the effort of the government is still being watered down as a result of what could be gathered to the, 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 the lack of interest by some parents, lack of interest by some families, lack of interest by some individuals, because even though the government have made a lot of noise around a uh, vaccination, eradication, but people are still yet to be conscientized on whether to push themselves forward to collect those vaccines. And we still need to do more. What this is telling us is that the effort of government needs to be strengthened more. What we need to strengthen government effort to ensure that this information is passed to the people and people have received this information and not just buy in into it. Because one thing we must also look at is that are the people even really buying into these uh, ag agencies of government in terms of getting their children to be vaccinated and the rest of them? Because when people are not buying into a government policy, it becomes a challenge. And that's what we are facing in the north. Although the religious group has also spoken around this, uh, engaged themselves around this, and they have already accepted. But what goes down to the people? Or should we take the, the same framework that we use in the family uh, pre, uh, pre health issues, in the what they call it, uh, pre health issues that we use for uh, a pregnant woman to also do, do for the 
the eradication of uh, vaccine or whatever we are talk talking about right now is very important for us to take advantage of. Now, moving forward to other issues in the mm -hmm. news, despite the concerns on the health of Nigerians and 70 new polio variants discovered mm -hmm. in 14 northern states, we'll move on to other newspapers of concern this morning. And uh, from the business perspective, let's look at the publication on the front page of the Business Day. On the Business Day this morning, you'd find the lead story. Finance Ministry, Customs Bureaucracy, Stalls, Zero Tariff, Food Importation. Finance Ministry, Customs Bureaucracy, Stalls, Zero Tariff, Food Importation. Now, the government of the day, mm -hmm. in order to ensure food security in Nigeria, moved to impose zero tariff duties on food importation of certain commodities. And over time, you've talked about how much this either hampers or improves mm -hmm. our over-dependence on importation. Exactly. But beyond that now, we're seeing certain bureaucratic hurdles at mm -hmm. the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. and Customs that is said to be stalling this project. Definitely, we should expect that. You know, the bureaucracy of government will be very slow in motion. And we should expect that. File from one table to the other table to the next table before you get to the CEO or the GO or whoever that is in charge of the organization. It will always be there. And, uh, you know, I, I, what I was expecting that a, a, a committee would have been formed or put together to handle this, part, this particular urgency in the economy, not allowing custom to take over and, la, and, and, and stall it the way the, the newspaper is putting it out. Because government means well for the people by allowing food to be imported, but the progress of government is stalling it by making it so slow, like a slow motion, by retarding the effort of government. And this could be a challenge. And by the time the, all this gets through now, the three months expire in January, we are in September, October, November, December. By the time the people f end up bringing those food, it will be a different story. Maybe by that time they will not say, okay, it has expired or whatever they have done has expired now, the price will not change. Then how has government achieved its goal? So what I'm trying to call up for is that government should see how they can strategize and ensure that the people who are in charge are following the duties of what the government will work. Because there's one direction from the presidency, there's another direction from the police of uh, finance. There's another direction from the uh, CG of custom. And the head of organization in custom, what they are doing, is also there's another different direction. Because when these directions are not working in unison, definitely there will be a stormage. And that stormage is what we are facing right now. I would just hope that they can qu quickly be amended and the importers can bring the food. And Nigerians can have a relief of cheaper food and accessible food that will have less tariff on go from government angle. But, but the challenge now is, does the solution to our food insecurity issues mm. lie solely mm. on zero tariff on food importations? Uh, although we have said it, not just tariff alone, we have said it that importation of food is not the sole way of ensuring that we have a cheaper and affordable food. Government need to go into productivity of food themselves. And government have been shining away. I've said it on this platform that the core number one food producer should be the government. Having farm settlement and farm estate everywhere, what are they doing with it? So, importation of food, although they have said it's a short gap measure to ensure that this food comes in within these 150 days or 160 days or 180 days, then people can have access to maize, rice, and millet and the rest of them. But we can see that the bureaucracy of government that has always been a challenge to government policy implementation has come to play its own role. And what is the role? Stalling the implementation of that policy, trying to indict or militate against it not to work. And government need to come out and correct it. So, as I pointed out, is that this kind of policy would have been a committee to handle it, not leaving it in the hand of custom, because they will always play their, those their bureaucratic bottleneck angle. What about if they are trying to hinder a particular importer, trying to collect it back, or trying to show one or two uh, uh, hindrances to that person not to be able to fulfill his own obligation? Those are the things that we are, the newspaper is trying to point out. But we just hope that government can take active action against this. But the best would have been that a committee would have been formed to handle this policy of government in terms of food importation, not even in the hand of a uh, custom. Now, despite announcements on July 15, with a period slated to last from the date of announcement to the 21st of December 2024, the Business Day newspaper this Tuesday does report that the Federal Ministry of Finance and the Nigerian Customs Service Red Tape is stalling the takeoff of a two-month intervention to help with the rising cost of food commodities in the market. This initiative is yet to take off, despite a zero tariff on food importation. Now, whilst that is the case, 
There has also been reports from the NDS that there has been a slight decline in inflation, with headline inflation pegged at 32.15% for the month of August. However, there has been an astronomical rise in the cost of food items in the markets. Now, particularly, there has been a report on a an increase in the cost of cooking gas in the market, which is said to have skyrocketed by 40%. Mm. Now, this is one of the market surveys that mm. over time you as an individual has taken exactly. much interest in monitoring the prices of goods in the market. Mm. Mm. What would you have to say in line with the failure of this initiative to take off mm. and the attendant results we're seeing in the market on food items and the cost of cooking gas? I one thing we must first know is that uh, the importation of those food majority of them, we are expecting them to come through the sea. We also are expecting large of them to also come through the border road. You get it? Now, the ones that are coming through the sea, like fish, like maize, like rice, it may take two months before a ship coming from India and from all those areas we normally bring rice, maize to come into the country. So that could also play a role in that delay. Then the ones that are coming through our neighboring countries in Chad, Mali, and the rest of we expect those ones to be coming in you know, speedily. Then in, in you talk about gas, you know, I've still talked a lot about gas. And gas is one of those international commodities that this period is the period of item price of gas. Because this is the period that most European countries normally store gas for the winter season. So we should expect a high cost of price of gas in Nigeria. And not to forget that we also produce gas in Nigeria. But we expected we, we export about 70% of it out. They will only give about 30 to 40% of it to local consumption. And we're also importing gas. So the international pricing of this commodity make it to be very expensive as we speak. So we should expect that the season of gas, whereby the price of gas will be going up, we are gradually entering that season. Between now and December, you see that the price of gas will go very high because this is the season whereby gas is mostly used for it. In Europe and America. Now, so the now, price will definitely Now, as we note that this is indeed factual, mm -hmm. the concern is that in the Niger Delta mm -hmm. and in areas where oil exploration is ongoing in Nigeria, mm -hmm. we continue to flare off our gas. Exactly. The federal government had talked about the mass amounts of gas reverb in mm -hmm. several cubic meters mm -hmm. feet that we need to tap into. Mm -hmm. But it almost feels as though the political will, would I say, mm -hmm. hasn't evidently translated into these reforms that we need so that we do not once again fall back on depending on importation. I, I think there is something we need to also recall. Last year, the NNPC and the other agencies of government in the area of gas awarded over 49 bid to 49 gas exploring companies. 49 of them collected the bid, paid for the bid, and they have been given opportunity to go and take advantage of those flaming gas. What has happened? Although it may take time before they build their, their project and the rest of them. So we expect them to start coming up with news about, report about what they have done so far in this glass flaring, what, how many refining gas stations have been able to build. So we're expecting that to happen. So we, uh, for now, we are not seeing any result in that regard. So we just hope that this will work for the government because they're already giving opportunity for people to invest in the gas area. But how manifesting at this particular project is where the challenge is. Although the government have tried its own part, but we just hope that the key aspect of it is that how NNLG can also give more of its gas to domestic consumption. So that's the main area because they are the only one producing gas right now. The other 49 I mentioned, they are still building their project. So as far as N energy is concerned, it's interesting international export of those gas. So if local consumption is also getting high, we need to augment it through domestic production that N energy is doing. But other importation of it also is not working because a lot of people are spending money in importation, which is not so giving them the right price of their goods. So we just hope that N energy can give local consumption higher percentage of what they are producing and that will help also subdue the high price of gas that we are experiencing now let's just inform you about what the market survey is saying as it concerns a purported 69.15 percent increase in the cost of liquefied petroleum gas otherwise known as cooking gas mm -hmm. the average retail price of refilling a 12.5 kg cylinder of liquefied petroleum gas otherwise known as cooking gas as of the month of August 2023, was 9,194 Naira. But on a year-on-year -year basis, as of August 2024, that amount is 15,552 Naira. And more worrying is the fact that even in Niger Delta states, this price hike is quite alarming, with uh, the report stating that it will cost 
above 16,500 naira to refill a 12.5 kg cooking gas. Now, now re responding to this development on our social media page, uh, a certain viewer, Goodness Udo, is reacting. She says, it is 60k in Lagos. I had to opt for 6kg, which is 35,000 naira in Aja market three weeks ago. Well, quite alarming the situation mm -hmm. of things as regards prices of goods in the mm -hmm. markets. And uh, whilst this is uh, a case study on LPG, the challenge is on the delay in takeoff of the zero imports on food, which has been announced by the president in the month of July and up mm -hmm. until now has failed to take off. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at one more local newspaper and uh, we'll look at the front page of The Guardian this morning. On The Guardian this morning, the reporters on the number of NGOs in the country are quite increasingly and uh, whilst it is non-profit business, it's on the impact it is having in society, which is the case study on The Guardian. On The Guardian this morning, you'd find the lead story with the catchphrase, no profit businesses amid low impact, over 174,100 new NGOs established in four years, over 5.1 million registered entities are in nigeria only 20 percent of registered entities pay annual returns millions of volunteers are in ngos now it also goes further to give a breakdown of the infographics accompanying the discussion as it says ngos are able to source millions of dollars in fundings to support a cause as of 2019 registered non-profit organizations were numbered at 91,117. Business names, 261,484. Incorporated trustees, including NGOs, 17,177. Now, between 2019 and 2023, the number of registered companies skyrocketed. Now stands at over 2,083,000. 364, while the number of registered business names stands at 2,895,333. Incorporated trustees, including NGOs, 191,278. Wow, mm. quite Very a shocking alarming. statistic. Exactly. You know, you know, one thing about NGOs is that we need to understand their functionality and operation. There are NGOs that we could also regard as CBOs and CSOs in regards to, you know, like for example, like my own organization is into a research and think tank and policy advisory. So you, you may, many people will not see our impact, but definitely people who are policy makers, media, people who are engaged in government may also see what we are doing. But ordinarily, you may not see because we're only into research and policy advisory. Now, there are NGOs that people see their impact in the health sector, in the education sector, who carried out relief, like what is happening in Bernoulli State right now. A lot of NGOs are donating. Those are the ones that you see their impact physically. Get it? So most of those ones that you are seeing their impact physically, you don't get to see them often because majority are also, also impacted by funding. And majority of the NGOs that you see that are making great impact are foreign NGOs who carried out step-down projects, which local NGOs to also carry out that project. But majority of them are also lacking because most of them also depend on foundation to make more money. So NGOs operational function is quite a uh, different based on what they are doing and what is expected to do. And also don't want to forget that some of them have influence on local locals as well as on government policies, particularly those ones that are into political education and the rest of them. Their influence are quite very alarming and government normally are very, very careful about such NGOs. So NGOs have different ways of impacting. Those in the health sector, health education sector, could be seeing their impact physically. But those of us that are in the policy research adversary, you may not see what we are doing, but those in policy making could see what we are doing. So that's how we need to understand the impact and function of NGOs. Of NGOs. Mm. Well, this is as much as we can take on our mm. local newspaper review. I must appreciate you for Thanks coming for on board to give your critical analysis as always. Mm. Thanks for having me.